By now, we've all heard of The Twelfth Night, the classic comedy created by the one and only Shakespeare. And by now, most of you are probably not tired of it. We've read it in class, watched the play, analyzed the plot, so on, so forth. So I figure it's best not to talk about The Twelfth Night. Rather, I'll talk about why it was created. Well then, why was the Twelfth Night created? Well, I'm glad you asked. To answer that question, we need to look at the quite mortifying history of the old British Isles, specifically England, Tudor England. You see, back in the early and mid-1500s, European society was only really starting to transition from medieval serfdom and castles and agrarianism and such to full-scale industrialization. People were still waddling and dobbing houses, mining was starting to boom, the wealth gap was growing, the usual, but there was also a social hierarchy being established. Trust me, this is important. Now, from medieval times, the nobility still persisted. The rich guys who owned the castles, yeah. But now, with all these other facets of labor and family histories and improving technologies and what have you, a lot more kinds of rich guys to pop up. Ones who don't have castles. Rich merchants and the like, shipping goods overseas. Even skilled trades, tradespeople getting their families manners and official coats of arms and land, cementing them as yeomen and such. On that point, yeomen, Title for landowners, you don't have any significant social hierarchy term above that, that's going to be really important, trust me. Anyhow, they're growing an amount. So now, not only is there a huge wealth gap and tons of low-down workers as there once was, but now there's an abundance of well-off well rich folk living in manors and having wealth and such. And it's not like they can just hire armies like the old nobility did to protect their wealth. That doesn't really have that much use in the increasingly more cemented state boundaries and industrializing society. It's a waste, it would be a waste of cash. So, among other things, what do these new swaths of rich people look for? Entertainment. So, Shakespeare, who is this guy? Well, that's the time all the way back to 1590. Shakespeare is this well-off, up-and-coming playwright who just wrote his first play. Or his first couple of plays, which came first, who knows, not much is known about the guy anyhow, aside from the incredible amount of study of him and his works that has been done by historians over the years. But the names and dates of those plays isn't important to the topic, but change the time again. This time to around 1596, Shakespeare has been dealing with his unfortunate and debilitating narcissism. Alright, he's not that horrible, but he does have a bit of an affinity, obsession, with being wealthy nobility. Shakespeare was born into a family of yeomen, and after his first few plays, he was feeling pretty ambitious. He applied for a household coat of arms, and only a year later he bought a big old family manor in the English countryside, real posh and the like. Now, he just jumped up from being a yeoman to now being only a step below nobility. Fast forward a couple years now, it's 1602. Shakespeare just finished, just finished writing up a new comedy of a play, The Twelfth Night. Now let's get to the point. Why did he write it? To understand why Shakespeare might have made this play, we need to find out what influenced Shakespeare in England at the time. Let's look at England as a whole. Life's getting less agrarian, urbanism's building up, people are living in towns, a decent portion too. By 1600, about one-eighth to one-fourth of the population of England lived in cities. Sure, that doesn't seem like much compared to today, but to put it in perspective, London nearly, London nearly tripled in population during that time span, while England's total population only grew by about a third. What I'm getting at is that there's a lot more people other than living in something other than constant farming, living close by and having more need for modern luxuries, hence the rise of the playwright. Shakespeare wasn't nearly the only playwright at this time. Dozens upon dozens of others sprung up and wrote comedies and tragedies and the like. The people wanted entertainment, and that's why Shakespeare wrote The Twelfth Night. But that's just scratching at the surface. The people wanted entertainment. Who were the people? Well, at that time, actors were seen to be parallel to not much more than vagabonds, and the copious amount of lower class bumbling about on dreary repetitive lives and urban plague and whatnot may allude to the fact that Shakespeare wrote to cheer the masses, so to forget real life and its trouble for some time. 
and it would make sense. But that, that's just one theory. Rather, it's more likely that Shakespeare wrote for the benefit of the rich, those who I stated previously to demand entertainment, to distract from their horrible lives of watching the poorly masses. Shakespeare himself was always enamored with the nobility and the idea of being part of it, with his coat of arms and man roading and such, and not to mention, the Twelfth Knight was incredibly likely to have been commissioned. By who? Well, by none other than some wealthy lawyers. Well, that's just the much less popular theory, the much more often mentioned and probable being from Queen Elizabeth I. Yes, most sources say that the Queen of England commissioned the play for the Twelfth Night's festivities. Shakespeare is writing the play, fawning over nobility, striving for nobility, for the nobility. Let's pivot out of my little rant there to the final part. Where does the Twelfth Night play sit in today's society? I'll tell you right out of the gate that the more modern adaptations use differing language and are no longer England-centric, but many aspects of the plot and characters hold up to today, and quite well at that. Also, I'm working off of a format of 1. What, con what concepts are preserved, 2. What elements are preserved, and 3. What was blatantly different. Let's start with She's the Man. A film from 2009 that takes a large amount of the plot and themes from the original Twelfth Night and translates them to a high school football, I, I mean soccer, redemption story. Just note, I'm going to get very specific and nitpicky here because I did quite enjoy breaking down the plot and character connections. When it comes to the concepts, I pres they preserve the romance and cross touching things quite well, arguably a near one to one with the original, but they did discard most of the old drunken revelry plotline. Likely because copious alcoholism, demonic possession, and duels sort of fell out of favor or otherwise inappropriate for a high school setting. I don't know. They did add a new factor to account for this, however. The whole uphill battle of Viola trying and somehow not failing to prove her masculinity at every possible moment. However, it should be known that Viola disguises Sebastian by appearance and name rather than just by appearance. Going over to the other elements, characters were mostly pre preserved. Here's some really quick. Viola is now a football aficionado who disguises as her brother to get into a rival high school called Lyria, what a coincidence, rather than a random shipwreck survivor, but still acts as the main character and gender disguiser. Duke Orsino is now the colloquial Duke, who, despite his modern position as a popular athlete, still acts as a coincidental love interest for Viola, despite the fact that Duke is straight and she is male. Sebastian is still Viola's brother, but is now an up-and-coming rock artist leaving the country for just long enough for Viola to play in the big game, and just as before, he acts as a concluding force for the cross-dressing plotline and agrees to hook up with Olivia in the end. Olivia is now the rich, popular girl, and honestly, her character acts is about the same as before, subtract the grief. She also weaponizes jealousy to spice things up a, bit, a little. The headmaster is a jester. Sir Andrew is now just Andrew. He is no longer a drunk rebel, but still organizes the downfall of Viola despite not having a romantic interest to do so. All right. For some final points on the changes in the adaptation, the main point of the plot was for Viola to disprove her old ex and coach about her soccer abilities. Antonia and Maria were completely sacked, and Toby was essentially rewrite fully, being used almost exclusively for one-off gags alongside the new Eunice, who was made to be Toby's new love interest. She could be concerned, Maria. Who knows? But now, the other two movies I won't describe nearly as in-depth as I didn't watch them, but I acquired enough information to get some points. Malvolio, first off. Made in 2009, it was designed to be a sequel to The Twelfth Night, while also being a mafia thriller. How The Twelfth Night inspired a mafia thriller is unbeknownst to me, but there are some interesting quirks about it, which are so out of place that despite the fact that it is a sequel, it holds almost no similarity to The Twelfth Night. And therefore, isn't even that great for arguing about it, how it adapts to modern times. But I'm still going to talk about it. Now, for concepts and plot lines that were preserved, there are none. For what specifics have been preserved, oh, how the characters still exist by name. Olivia and Sebastian are married, as you may expect since the proclaimed sequel status. What's been changed, that's, that's a whole story. Firstly, the main plot is centered around the Sebastian Olivia versus Malvolio dynamic, but in no way that you may guess. To get to that, we'll also explain Orsino. Firstly, it's set in a modern day 
city. Which city? IMDB didn't say. Orsino's a mob boss, and Sebastian has old ties to the Mafia. Olivia has nothing to do with it. File is there. Not clear how or why, but she's friends to Olivia. All the people who were in the original story... who All the people who were in the original story employed to Olivia are in this story employed to Orsino. Sir Toby, not this Toby, is a hard drug cooker and dealer. Malvolio is a mafioso and or contract killer with ties to Orsino's mafia who acts as Sebastian's tie to the mafia and also Malvolio wants to kill Sebastian despite no longer being part of the mob. Maria's Toby's love interest which follows through. Not married though despite the fact that they were presumably at the end of the original story. They said that they got married. Fabian's a gun runner for the mafia. Feste, who was the jester, is now hired assassin. You know, I have a feeling that this isn't really a sequel. It's not a sequel. It contains no elements, no plotline continuity, no nothing. It doesn't even preserve the characters. How it just preserves the names and two relationships. That's it. This is not a sequel. How could this possibly be a sequel? It's a mafia thriller, a horror-esque film, sequel to a comedy. Yeah, right. Coming up next is Kami and Kahali, a direct adaptation of the Twelfth Night's romance plotline to the language and culture of the Tamil region of India, made in 1949. Additionally, I'm going to be guessing the pronunciations of half these names since I didn't bother write down the correct pronunciation of the script and I don't know how Indian languages work. Four concepts were preserved. The whole romance and cross-dressing plotline were kept nearly one to one. Impressive. They did discard a lot of the whole drunken revelry thing entirely and unlike She's the Man, they didn't bother to put anything else to replace it. But elsewise, it's quite accurate. For what was preserved? For what else was preserved? I'll just say the characters and their new names, since everything about them is pretty much about the same. Viola is now Princess Chandrika. Sebastian is now Prince Adathan. Cesario is now Kalamani. Duke Orsino is now Prince Vasanthakumar. Vasanthakumar? Vasanthakumar. And Olivia is Megala Devi. For what was changed, it's more so what was discarded. Save for the fact that everyone involved is royalty to some degree, which was the trend for Tamil movies at the time. None of the servants exist, nor does Sir Toby or Sir Andrew, nor does Antonio, nor does the Jester. Anyhow, the previous change to everyone being royalty was actually to adapt the movie to the times and place, which is something that I put here as Important since finding out how it was adapted to modern times was the whole point of this part. Oh, yeah, I must have gotten off track in Malvolio. Put the, put the card here. Put the next part here. Put the, put the type card for that here. So, here are my concluding thoughts on the matter, along with a summary of what's been said. What was life like back then? That'll be the whole thing about Tudor England and the rich and the poor and the population and the plague and such. The main point of that section existed to follow into the next. What was life like back then? Well, that would be the whole thing about Tudor England and the rich and the poor and the population and the plague and such. The main point of that section existed to follow into the next. Why was comedy relevant? I took that as why did Shakespeare write the Twelfth Night, since it both would have ultimately led to the same answer due to the focus we had on the Twelfth Night in this project. There I concluded that Shakespeare definitely wrote it for the nobility, and likely wrote it due to the commission from Elizabeth I. Why is Shakespeare relevant today through modern adaptations? Well, it's hard to say. Mainly, I fully believe that the original easily stands the test of time even with the language barrier, but many movie producers from over the world have taken the time to try and reformat the play to more widely used in modern forms and terminology, allowing the continued relevance of a plot originally created long before Shakespeare. Though I personally argue they're not keeping Shakespeare relevant. Oh no, Shakespeare himself didn't invent the main romance cross-dressing plotline of the Twelfth Night that carried through to today. That title belongs to Barnaby Rich the writer of Apollonius and Celia, which was no, which is the first known play to use such a plot. Arguably, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night is actually an, at the time, modern adaptation for Apollonius and Celia. Modern directors have been keeping Barnaby relevant, not Shakespeare. That is my claim, and those are my closing thoughts. The end. Do I look angry enough? Cool. There's the end card.
I'm now going to read our works cited in ASMR style, because I think that's funny. Works cited. Author. Title. Website. Date edited. URL. Access. That's the template I used. I forgot to remove it. Bostock. Sarah. When was the Twelfth Night written? Historical context. Study. 4th of August, 2015. Think. I'm not going to read out the links. I don't want to do that. Access 17th of March, 2023. Doe, J. Colin, Jeff. A History of Epidemics in Britain. Epidemics in Britain, 2014. Link. Access 17th of March, 2023. Editors. History.com. History of Christmas. History. 21st of December, 2022. Link. Access 17th of March 2023. Green Seabot, et al. Kanyan Kathali, Wikipedia, 27th of January 2023. Link. Access 17th of March 2023. Lambert, Tim, Tudor Society, Local Histories, 14th of March 2021. HTTPS. <laughs> HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash local histories or forward slash life hyphen in hyphen the hyphen sixteenth hyphen century forward slash period access sixteenth of march twenty twenty three Lotha Gloria et al. Twelfth night Encyclopedia Britannica twenty second of february twenty twenty three link seventeenth of march twenty twenty three access oh I forgot to put access there I'm sorry. Malvolio, British University's Film and Video Council, 2009. Link. Access 17th of March 2023. Malvolio, IMDb, 2009. Link. Access 17th of March 2023. Petrozello, Melissa, et al. Epiphany, Encyclopedia Britannica, 7th of December 2022. Link. Access 16th of March 2023. She's the Man. Directed by Andy Fickman. Performances by Amanda Burns et al. Dreamworks. 2009. Weiss Rain. Shakespeare's Social Status. Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. 2023. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.shakespeare.org.uk forward slash explore hyphen Shakespeare forward slash podcast forward slash 60 hyphen minutes hyphen Shakespeare forward slash Shakespeare so hyphen social hyphen status forward slash hashtag colon tilde colon text equals it percent 20 seems percent 20 that percent 20 he percent 2c percent 20 who comma land percent 2c percent 20 teeths percent 2c percent 20 and percent 20 property period access 17th of march 2023